Uh, certainly, on behalf of myself and the National Academy of Medicine, we're delighted to partner with ASN. Previously, we have partnered with other organizations such as International Academies, the Royal Society, the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. We partner with government institutions and agencies and major foundations and other nonprofits. But this is our first partnership with a specialty society. I'm very excited about this. We certainly are excited to extend our reach and collaboration with special societies to broaden our impact and highlight different areas of medicine. What better area than kidney disease for us to start such a relationship? So Susan, you know that this would not have happened without you because it was you that brought the vision and foresight to me to work together, to develop this program. You know, given the importance of and the relation between COVID-19 and kidney diseases, the time is right for National Academy of Medicine and ASN to partner on this plenary session to bring the most up-to-date information on COVID with a global focus on kidney disease. This session will highlight viral pathogenesis, the importance of COVID variants in development of next-generation therapies and vaccines, and provide expert opinions on public health policy and potential long-term impact on cardiovascular and kidney disease. Now, we have a great lineup of outstanding speaker for today's open, opening plenary. First, we begin with a keynote from Tony Fauci on public health lessons learned and implications for future pandemic. This keynote will be followed by a panel of experts moderated by Sanjay Gupta. So let me first introduce Tony Fauci who obviously does not need any introduction. Dr. Fauci has provided unprecedented service to the nation. As the director of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at NIH. He oversees an extensive research portfolio on infectious disease and immune-related diseases. Dr. Fauci has made many seminal contributions to basic and clinical research and is one of the world's most cited our medical scientists. He was one of the principal architects of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS re Relief, or PEPFA, a program that saved millions of lives throughout the developing world. He has been a trusted advisor to six U.S. presidents, um, including, of course, currently President Biden. And during public health crises, such as HIV, AIDS, SARS, anthrax, influenza, Ebola, and now COVID-19, he has been amazing a voice of trusted voice and steady leadership. We certainly see this in COVID-19. He's offered an unwavering trusted voice to the nation and the world on behalf of science-based policy and public health. So please welcome Dr. Tony Fauci. Greetings, everyone. This is Tony Fauci here at the National Institutes of Health, and it is a great pleasure and a privilege to speak to you today as part of Kidney Week 2021. As you can see, the title of my talk is COVID-19 Lessons Learned and Remaining Challenges. This will be a very brief overview, so let's get right at it. I've divided my very brief presentation into six elements. The first is a quick look at the epidemiology we know now that beginning in the late December and in 2019 and early 2020, when the first cases appeared in the Wuhan district of China, we now today have over 240 million cases and globally 5 million deaths. The United States is one of the worst hit countries with already 45 million cases and over 730,000 deaths. The distribution per 100,000 population by the darkness of the blue shade is shown on this slide. And still we are right in the middle of it, despite the fact that cases, as you can see, on the right-hand side of the slide are beginning to diminish. But if one looks at the various surges that we've experienced over the last 20 months, we can see that we want to make sure we get these cases down to a very low level without rebound. Hopefully in the context of vaccine, this will be attainable. I'll get to vaccines in a moment. Looking at the virology, this is now a very well-studied virus. It's a beta coronavirus. 
of the same subgenus as SARS-CoV-1 in certain bat coronaviruses and RNA virus with a large genome for structural proteins, the most important of which is the S or spike protein, which contains the receptor binding domain, binding to the ACE2 receptor on tissues throughout the body, particularly the upper and lower airways, the GI tract, cardiovascular tissue, and endothelial cells. The transmission now with the experience we've had is very well established by exposure to respiratory fluids, either true respiratory droplets or the inhalation of aerosol particles. There's a deposition on the mucous membrane, usually of the mouth, nose, or eyes, and transmission, although this was not fully realized early on, is much less common through contact with contaminated surfaces, with the greater, greater risk being in places with poor ventilation and certain behaviors such as exercise, hence the increased risk in gyms, singing, hence the increased risk in chorals and quiet, uh, choruses and chorals, such as in churches. Another very important and unusual aspect of this particular infection is that anywhere between 50 and 60% of all the transmissions occur from someone who does not have any symptoms, either who will never get symptoms or who is in the pre-symptomatic stage of the infection. The clinical course for those who do in fact get symptoms are mild to moderate in about 80% of them and severe to critical in anywhere from 15 to 20%, leading to a case fatality rate overall of about 2.3%, but up to 20% in people requiring mechanical ventilation. Speaking of severe outcomes of COVID-19, this is much more likely to be seen in elderly individuals, but as well as people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, chronic lung, kidney, and heart disease. Shown here, some of the medical conditions that are strongly associated are listed here, but no chronic kidney disease is clearly among the most prominent. We know now from studies that have been conducted during this outbreak of something about the pathophysiology of COVID-19 associated acute kidney disease, where more than 25% of patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 have developed acute kidney injury. Therapeutics, a very important component of countermeasures. One can divide it into two major components, targeting the virus itself, such as drugs like remdesivir, which requires intravenous administration. It's an FDA approved drug. We have a number of monoclonal antibodies that have been very encouraging if given early on in the course of infection to prevent the progression that would need hospitalization. I would point out among the other antivirals that have been uh, uh, studied, one in particular, malnupiravir, which has now been shown in the clinical trial to diminish by 50% hospitalizations and deaths, that is now being considered for an emergency use authorization. Late in the course of disease, moderating the host response due to the aberrant inflammatory and immunological response by commonly used therapeutics such as dexamethasone, but also with monoclonal antibodies such as tocilizumab against IL-6 receptor and baricitinib against JAK kinase. Again, there's a major effort now in targeting antivirals to develop more orally administered drugs given early in the course of infection to prevent progression to severe disease and hospitalizations. And finally, vaccinations have really been the success story of COVID-19 and the core of our interventions. In fact, the rapidity with which we went from just noticing and understanding and identifying a virus in the first weeks of January of 2020 to then 11 months later, having more than one vaccine proven to be highly efficacious and safe going into the arms of individuals was deemed appropriately by Science Magazine as the science breakthrough of the year in 2020. It was a conflation of scientific advances, including the development of new technologies in the form of platform technologies, particularly the now very promising 
messenger RNA technology, as well as the stabilization of the immunogen in its pre-fusion form to give maximal immunogenicity, work done by Barney Graham and his colleagues at the NIAID Vaccine Research Center. As you can see from this slide, we now have three platforms in vaccines that are now as part of the US government development portfolio. One of them has already received full FDA approval, the BioNTech Pfizer product, Two have received emergency use authorizations, the Moderna and the J&J product, and the others are now in various stages of development. We have shown the field, that is, extraordinary efficacy in clinical trials, very impressive real-world effectiveness, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. But importantly, we've now faced the challenge of the impact of various SARS-CoV-2 variants caused by certain constellation of mutations that have accumulated in some of the isolates, the most important of which for us has been the Delta variant, which actually is now shown to be much, much more transmissible than any of the other variants, and in fact occupies more than 99% of all the isolates in the United States and is seen in over 173 countries. Viral loads when measured of Delta versus other variants such as Alpha are up to a thousand times greater, clearly explaining the high degree of transmissibility. This challenge has been compounded by what we're seeing as waning immunity over a period of time from the time one gets vaccinated. This is particularly evident in studies from Israel, which is about a month to a month and a half ahead of us in the dynamics of the outbreak and in the distribution of their vaccines. And the Israeli study showed waning immunity, not only in protection against infection, but against severe disease. And we are starting to see that very, very clearly in cohorts that are now followed throughout the country, which leads us to the issue of booster shots for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And a number of studies that we've performed here and others in other countries makes it very clear of the extraordinary benefit of booster shots for getting maximal degree of protection. And again, getting back to our colleagues in Israel have shown that when given a third dose of BioNTech Pfizer in a situation in the context of a Delta variant where the immunity has waned, there has been a 19-fold diminution in the risk of severe illness in the elderly and about a 22-fold lowering of the risk for people younger, ages 40 to 60, which leads to now, after studies and examination by the FDA and the CDC, the people eligible for COVID vaccines, the same for Pfizer and Moderna, 65 years of age or older, or anyone 18 or older, either in a long care facility, or underlying medical conditions or in a high risk occupational or living setting. J and J, anyone 18 years of age or older who were vaccinated more than two months ago with the J and J are, el are eligible now for a boost. So finally, just what we know is that we are in a race against the vaccine to get ourselves optimally vaccinated and to do so to ultimately get that curve that I showed you on a prior slide to continue to come down to an extremely low level when we no longer are in a pandemic phase. I wanna close by just two observations for you. Several years ago, my colleagues and I wrote an article in Lancet Infectious Diseases talking about emerging infections and why this is truly a perpetual challenge because of the history that we have now experienced. And we know it will come again. And a perpetual challenge requires perpetual preparedness. And in this regard, I'll close with this slide, looking forward to our ability to prepare for future pandemics. The White House has recently released a $65 billion pandemic preparedness plan that really has an Apollo program type design to transform the way that we as a nation respond to pandemics in part by vastly accelerating our capability for vaccine development, therapeutic development, testing, and production. Thank you very much.
Hi, my name is Ashish John. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University and a practicing hospitalist at the Providence VA Medical Center here in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I'm thrilled to be with you today and, and really looking forward to the panel discussion. Uh, my hope is to spend a few minutes right now talking about uh, global vaccinations, the challenges of global vaccinations, and the particular importance of people with chronic disease, kidney disease and the reasons we need to make sure they remain a priority in our global vaccination strategy. So I don't need to tell this crowd the importance of chronic kidney disease. Uh, by 2010, the data suggested that it's one of the 20 leading causes of death and disability from the global burden of disease war. And those numbers have only grown as populations have gotten older, as hi hypertension, diabetes have become, become more widespread around the world. And so people living with chronic kid uh, kidney disease remain uh, a growing population, uh, a population that needs more care, but also a population that's much more vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, vulnerable to infections. And, and because of their immunosuppressed state, uh, vulnerable to bad outcomes uh, from COVID-19. And this really gets us to the topic at hand, which is global vaccinations. And how do we make sure that we vaccinate the world? So as of right now, uh, as we, uh, you know, in, in mid fall of 2021, uh, early November, we are at approaching about 7 billion doses administered into people's arms around the world. That sounds extraordinary, and in many, many ways it is. Uh, 7 billion doses, and we're doing about a billion doses a month. Uh, that has meant that about half the world, the half of humanity has already been vaccinated. That's terrific. Uh, in countries like the United States, in Europe, uh, we see relatively high rates of vaccinations. Actually, America not doing as well as many European countries, uh, but between 60 and 65% of our populations are vaccinated. We see that in much of Latin America as well. Uh, across Asia, uh, China is among the most vaccinated places in the world. India is approaching its 50% mark and other countries across Asia are doing well as well. But there are pockets of places in, in the world where vaccination rates remain very low. Uh, and there are pockets in Asia, there are pockets in Latin America, but the big place where the world has just ignored, has kept vaccines away, has not done its moral obligation is on the continent of Africa. About 5% of the African continent has been fully vaccinated. While much of the world is making great progress, Africa is moving very, very slowly. Why is that? Why is Africa particularly vulnerable? Um, it's really a lot driven by vaccine nationalism. Africa has the resources to purchase vaccines. That's not the issue. The issue is that the vaccines are not available. They're not available because wealthy and middle-income countries have decided to focus on themselves first and, and really taking all the vaccine doses that are out there and um, and keeping it really for their own supply. Uh, this is a huge problem because we cannot get past this pandemic until we have the whole world vaccinated. So what do we need to do? So right now, what we need to do is again, you know, in, in high income countries, including some middle income countries like China and, and even increasingly India, we are seeing a surplus of vaccines. Uh, and so first huge part of the strategy has to be getting vaccines out there and donated. Uh, through COVAX, which is a mechanism set up by WHO to get vaccines out uh, to countries around the world, but also working directly with national partners and regional partners. One of, my, one of the organizations that I have come to believe is one of the most effective regional partners that the United States should be working with is the Africa CDC and getting vaccines out to the African continent. That's got to be number one, get the vaccines out there. Second is we still got to do a lot of work on building up cap, uh, capacity for manufacturing. A billion doses a day, uh, sorry, a month, I wish it was a day, a billion doses a month sounds like a lot, and it is, but it is not enough. And this is just to try to get everybody that first and second dose. People will need boosters over time, and we have got to do a lot more on increasing van vaccine manufacturing capacity, particularly on the continent of Africa, to create more self-sufficiency and allow the African people and the African nations to be able to access the vaccines that the, other, the rest of the world has been holding off. Again, this is no longer an issue of resources. This is really the African, many African countries have more than enough resources to do this. It is the difficulties that other countries have made in allowing people to purchase more vaccines. Finally, 
um, we really have to think about the priority populations. Obviously, we don't need to vaccinate everybody immediately or, or not everybody is of the same priority. We've got to obviously focus on people who are older. We have to focus on people with cr uh, chronic diseases, people who are vulnerable. And this is where really making sure that we are vaccinating people with, with chronic infections, people uh, with cardiovascular disease, people with chronic kidney disease, particularly important, people who are high risk of focusing on those populations. Uh, if we begin there, even if we don't get everybody vaccinated immediately, we're gonna dramatically lower mortality and suffering from this virus. I, I think this is all very achievable. I am confident that at some point in 2022, we will have more than enough vaccines. Right now, we're still in a place where we've got to put a lot more time, effort, and resources into getting more vaccines out to the world, but particularly to the African continent. And then over the long run, we have to help, uh, we have to build a strategy where there's much greater levels of uh, vaccine production capacity across the world. And what I have heard from my African colleagues is this is no more. This is the last time that they will leave their fate in the hands of others. I think you're going to see a resurgent Africa that is going to be very bold in building its own capacity. But that is for the future. Right now, we've really got to have a global approach, and that means getting more vaccines out to the rest of the world. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this excellent event, and I look forward to the discussion. I'm going to talk about coronavirus variants. Where do they come from? And then I'm going to speculate a little bit about where they are going. So first, my disclosures. So I'm going to give a little bit of background first. So this is the coronavirus particle. Um, it's composed of a, of a large uh, 30 kilobase RNA genome complex with a protein called the nucleocapsid protein, forming this capsid structure inside of the virus particle. And surrounding the capsid is a membrane shown here that's derived from the host cell when the virus is assembled. Within the membrane, there are three viral proteins, the spike protein that everyone's probably heard about. And this is really important protein because it attaches to the cellular receptor and in doing so mediates a fusion of the viral and host membranes and mediates entry. It also is important for mediating spread uh, from cell to cell. And finally, it's also a very important target for the immune response uh, that's elicited by the mRNA vaccine and some of the other vaccines as well. The two other proteins in the membrane are the membrane protein M, the small membrane protein E, and they both play roles in replication as well as in viral assembly. So I wanna talk a little bit about the history of human coronaviruses and the spillover of these viruses from animals into humans. So we first heard about human coronaviruses back in the 60s and 70s when OC43 and 229E were reported to cause the common cold. From that time until about uh, 2002, there was a lot of basic coronavirus biology research carried on and it was a pretty obscure field, but there were a bunch of us working on it for, for during all this time period. So that in 2002, when SARS coronavirus emerged in southern China, it was quickly identified as a coronavirus, and as we know, caused severe acute respiratory disease. And it was the first of several viruses to do so. Um, and, and we knew, we learned at that shortly after that that um, that SARS had its origin in bats and was transmitted to a civet and then to humans. And again, this was in two thousand and two. Um, and just after that, HKU1 and NL63, two further non-lethal coronaviruses were identified. And following that, in 2012, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. It also was shown to have a bad origin to be transmitted through camels into humans. And then finally, in late 2019, we all know now that um, SARS-CoV-2 emerged in, in uh, a different part of China, in Wuhan. Um, and this virus almost definitely has a bad origin. We don't know really if it has an intermediate species, and it was clearly transmitted to humans in 2019. Um, but we also know now that probably all these cold, these uh, common coronaviruses also have the origins in animals. OC43 was transmitted from cattle or pigs to humans in the late 19th century. Um, 229E is believed to have come from bats to camels to humans in the late 18th century and NL63 from bats to humans in the 13th to 15th century. And the reason I think it's important to, to think about this data is because it illustrates that coronaviruses are all zoonotic, or we think they are, and they evolve as they spread into, into and among humans. And I think that the variants can be thought of as SARS-CoV-2 
um, continuing to adapt to optimize spread among humans. And um, I want to talk now a little bit about the viral spike protein some more. The spike protein is the site of most of the genetic changes in variants. Um, and the spike protein will help us to explain why we have variants, quote, of concern. So here, all coronavirus spike proteins are divided into two subunits, S1 and S2. Um, S1 contains a receptor binding domain. That's the part of the protein that is critical for, uh, for attaching to the host receptor uh, and to infect cells. And so therefore this, um, this domain or this part of the spike is very important for virus entry. S2 contains the so-called machinery for fusion. It actually mediates the viral and cell fusion. And this TM here just means transmembrane domain that attaches the spike protein to the membrane. Then another important uh, part of the molecule is, is this site here, this S1, S2 cleavage, so-called cleavage site. So there has to be a cleavage or cutting of the protein right down the middle into S1 and S2. And this is mediated usually by a protein called furin, a protease, and it recognizes a run of basic amino acids at the intersection of S1 and S2. And this is really important for virus spread, and I'll show you in a minute why. And then in addition, the spike protein is the, is the target for the antibody response uh, generated by the mRNA vaccine or by the um, adenovirus vaccines as well. And so um, antibodies are generated that, represent, that, that recognize um, sequences or epitopes all along the spike protein. And it's clearly the ones that recognize the receptor binding domain that are most important for neutralizing the virus. Now I want to explain how variants arise, and variants arise during normal replication of coronavirus genome RNA. So here's the very long genome RNA, um, the, and it's copied or it's translated into a replicase complex, and this enzyme then copies back the genome into a negative strand copy of the genome called the antigenome. This enzyme then copies back more positive strand genomes that are going to go into progeny virus. Now, this replicase, or, or RDRP as it's called, is quite error prone. So every time it makes a copy or makes a new genome, it might have an error or mutation in it. And we see these at random places in, in the uh, viral genome. And usually they're either have a negative effect on replication or no effect, and they just kind of die out. However, if a mutation occurs in the spike gene and this mutation um, may confer a selective advantage for replication or spread, a virus with this genome will emerge as a variant and kind of take over the population. So let's look at the spike protein again and why some of these variants are of concern. So here's the, the alpha variant or the UK, what was used to be called the UK variant, and it has mutation, this important mutation in the receptor binding domain, and another one in this furin cleavage site that I just mentioned, and some other ones in S2. The uh, beta variant or the South Africa variant also has mutations in the receptor binding domain and another one here. And then the, the Delta variant that we've been hearing about a lot lately, lately has mutations also in the receptor binding domain and also in this furin cleavage site again. So why are these of concern? Well, there's several reasons. Um, one reason is that they may confer increased receptor binding. This N501Y mutation that's present in both of these variants will do so, and perhaps the delta um, receptor binding domain variant mutations as well will confer better binding. And uh, the second reason is this to, is this furin site again, this, this proline to histidine mutation or proline to arginine mutation, each one of them will make this cleavage site a more basic uh, sequence of amino acids, and that will cause increased cleavage of S1 and S2, and this will potentially allow the virus to, to cause more cell-to-cell -cell fusion and, and viral entry as well. Um, now... There are also, and then, and then the third reason is immune escape. So this E484 uh, to K mutation is in an important epitope recognized by the antibody. So mutation of this epitope might reduce somewhat a particular um, ability of a particular antibody to neutralize the virus. And in addition, mutations in other genes may contribute to giving this virus an advantage for replication as well. But these are the three main reasons I think that these variants have been of concern so far. Um, and just to illustrate, uh, this is cell-to-cell -cell fusion caused by SARS-CoV-2 infection, and this is a tissue culture 
uh, cell, cell line. Um, this is from my own lab. And you can see here the green represents viral replication or viral protein. The blue are nuclei. And you can see these very large so-called syncytia with many nuclei in them. And they're really just evidence of a viral spread, cell to cell spread. This is A549, a long derived cell line. We also see this in a more primary kind of cell. These are cardiomyocytes uh, from, made uh, from induced pluripotent stem cells. And you can see here that we also see some multinucleated cells, not as large as we see in the cell lines, but we can see some cells with two or three nuclei. Um, in this, in this um, image, the green again represents viral proteins um, and the blue is nuclei. The red here is just a marker for the cardiomyocytes. So, oh, and I can, and as I said before, the mutation of proline to histidine or arginine will probably um, confer more cell to cell fusion and better spread of the virus. These are some data gathered by my colleague, Rick Bushman, um, that plot the accumulation of variants of concern over the last eight months in the Delaware Valley. And we can see here, we can look on the left here, that um, during, during early March, during the spring, we see uh, that the alpha variant and some other more minor variants, iota, mu, are accumulating uh, during those few months of the spring. However, by the time we get to the summer, almost everything we're isolating here from, from patients is um, Delta or something related to Delta. So Delta has clearly taken over um, as a predominant uh, SARS-2 isolate. Um, so I want to consider, lastly, questions to consider going forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me this morning to talk with you about our society's COVID-19 response team. Since February 22nd, 2020, our response team has built web pages with information that have had more than 70,000 downloads. We've developed podcasts related to COVID-19 that have had more than 50,000 downloads. We developed posters for the dialysis facilities related to infection control and COVID vaccines that have had more than 5,000 downloads. The response team has developed frequently asked questions and acute kidney injury documents that have had more than 10,000 downloads. We produced 20 webinars with more than 50,000 attendees, and we held Twitter chats in collaboration with NEFJF JC on March 17, 2020, related to COVID-19 in general, that had more than 4 million impressions, more than 1,500 tweets, and more than 270 participants. On September 21, 2021, we held a, a, a Twitter chat related to monoclonal antibodies and vaccines, that had more than 9 million impressions, more than 1,000 tweets, and more than 170 participants. We've partnered with community agencies, including the American Association of Kidney Patients, the American Kidney Fund, the American Nephrology Nurses Association, the CDC, the Nephrology, the National Association of Nephrology Technicians and Technologists, the National Kidney Foundation, the Renal Healthcare Association, and the Renal Physicians Association. We've collaborated with dialysis organization chief medical officers and held more than 49 calls and counting to date. We've partnered with the American College of Emergency Physicians, the Council of Medical Specialty Societies, the American Society of Transplantation, the American Medical Association and the CDC, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and the Kidney Community Emergency Response Coalition. On Easter weekend 2020, we partnered with New York City healthcare organizations to evaluate the need for continuous dialysis supplies during the acute surge that the city experienced. We've also reached out during surges in California, North Dakota, Washington State, and Wisconsin to society members. We've partnered with numerous government agencies, including the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, the CDC, the CMS, the Department of Defense, the FDA, the Department of Health and Human Services, the National Governors Association, and the White House. We've advocated for increased amounts of PPE, dialysis access surgery, waivers, increased use of telehealth, and increased access to critical care for patients on dialysis. We've advocated against herd immunity, we've advocated for vaccines for patients on dialysis, and we've advocated for increased use of monoclonal antibodies for patients with kidney disease. We partnered with the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response to 
to hold the Scarce Resources Roundtable on July 28th and 30th of 2020. We developed online learning modules. The first was developed to prepare people for a COVID-19 surge. It had more than 5,500 views, more than 600 of which occurred within 12 hours of posting. And on September 10th of 2021, we developed a mental health wellness compassion fatigue module that had more than 850 visits within the first 30 days. In terms of presentations, we've had more than 30 media interviews, dozens of community presentations, and more than 20 peer-reviewed articles in journals, as you can see listed there. Our team has been led by our co-chairs, partnering with Alan Kleiger, who's been a friend, a mentor, and a leader. It does truly take a village. We've had three, four subcommittees, one led by Anita, Vanita Kumar, one led by Jeff Pearl, and one led by Anita Vijayan. Our CDC representatives in, or have been Anna Cecilia Bardassi, Stephanie Booth, Shannon Novosad, and Priti Patel. Our team has worked with Christina Bryant, Debbie Cody, Alpa Kisler, Nikki Lurie, Liz McNamara, Glenda Roberts, and Matt Sinclair. The 56 members of our subcommittees, who you'll see on these slides, have participated in more than 100 meetings. Our outpatient dialysis subcommittee, which I've led, our home dialysis subcommittee, led by Jeff Pearl, our acute kidney care subcommittee, led by Anitha Vijayan, and the transplant subcommittee, which was led by Michelle Josephson until she got elected to our council and since has been led by Vanita Kumar. Finally, I want to thank our ASN staff, the Excellence in Patient Care team led by Susie Stark, as well as Bonnie Freshley, Carrie Lee, Darlene Rogers, Matt Howard, Javier Rivera, and Colin Richardson, our legislative and policy team, Rachel Meyer and David White, the education team led by Laura McCann, and the innovation team led by Mark Lynn. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank ASN's leadership, particularly our council led by President Sue Quaggan, and our Executive Vice President, Todd Ibrahim. Thank you. Hello, my name's Amitabha Banerjee. I'm Professor of Clinical Data Science at University College London, and I'm also a cardiologist at Barts Health and University College London Hospitals. Today, I'm going to be talking about long haulers and implications for public health and, and uh, COVID. And uh, I should say that long COVID is the term that we use rather than long haulers um, on our side of the pond, but it's, it's interchangeable. Um, these are my conflicts of interest, and um, importantly, I do work both clinically and academically. So this Lance editorial by Richard Horton coined the term in relation to COVID-19, the syndemic, which is how a cardiologist ends up working in the field of COVID-19. So syndemic is a convergence of an infectious disease Undertreated non communicable diseases and social determinants of health in a syndemic rather than a pandemic. And this is relevant to chronic diseases such as chronic kidney disease. Here on the left of the slide, we showed that 20% of the population in the UK fell into the so called high risk population for hospitalization and mortality from COVID 19. And on the right of the slide, you see that the baseline mortality of people with chronic kidney disease is only surpassed by people with COPD. And the more diseases that you have underlying, the more comorbidities, the higher the risk. And that's what drives mortality from COVID. And when we published this paper in May, um, we showed that if the infection rate was allowed to rise to 10% or more, there would be over 70,000 deaths in the UK. And of course, um, this sadly did play out. This was confirmed by uh, the Open Safely um, project run by um, Dr. Ben Goldacre. And again, chronic kidney disease does indeed lead to increased risk of COVID hospitalization and mortality very clearly. So these are direct effects of the pandemic, but there are also indirect effects on individuals with chronic kidney disease and other chronic diseases. We showed that cancer services were reduced during the pandemic we showed that um, reduced rates of endoscopy occurred. And we also showed that there was an impact on people with cardiovascular disease. And particularly when they themselves had underlying comorbidities, including uh, chronic kidney disease. 
So long COVID occurs on the backdrop of direct and indirect effects of COVID. But on the left of the slide here, we conducted the first study to look at multi-organ impairment in um, long COVID, showing that 70% of people in this cohort, 200 um, patients four months after their initial illness, they, these were largely non-hospitalized. So 70% of them had a single organ impaired and 30% had two or more organs affected. On the right of the slide, we looked at over 45,000 individuals who had been hospitalized with COVID with the Office for National Statistics in, the, in England. And we showed that over 10% of them were dead within um, four months of being discharged from hospital. And 30% of them were admitted to hospital. So even if you recover from the acute illness, there can be chronic effects. And, and also there's new disease in the form of diabetes, new chronic kidney disease, new cardiovascular disease. And in this analysis of over 270,000 patients in um, US veteran care data, uh, analyzed by colleagues in the University of Oxford, the panel to look at is the bottom left here that shows when we look at long COVID symptoms, the prevalence of long COVID symptoms are no less in non-hospitalized than hospitalised and, in fact, can be more. Uh, so being hospitalised or not does not um, uh, necessarily uh, make the major factor for whether you have long COVID. Long COVID is, is an entity that we have to view through the public health lens, and the best way to prevent it is to avoid being infected in the first place, and we need to make sure that vaccination is as high as it can be at population level. But we need to also recognise and refer appropriately, manage and rehabilitate and try and get people back to the community as quickly as we can at health system level. In a large NIHR funded study, Stimulate ICP, we're looking at three aspects over the next two years. We're looking firstly at current care evaluation for the disease across uh, England. We are secondly conducting a large pragmatic uh, cluster randomized trial of an integrated care pathway, including the cover scan, which is multi-organ MRI, and also a digitally enhanced rehabilitation um, platform. And embedded within this trial, there is a drug platform study where initially we're looking at antihistamines, the combination of famotidine and loratidine. The primary outcome here is fatigue on the fatigue assessment scale at three months. We're also in the third part of the project looking at inequalities and how we can improve referral rates in harder to reach populations and looking at the transferability to other long-term conditions. So people with chronic kidney disease and other chronic diseases are affected directly, indirectly, and in the long term by uh, the, the pandemic. And chronic kidney disease is acting as a risk factor, as a disease, and as an outcome from infection with SARS-CoV-2. So the key take-homes are that infection suppression is best. We need to improve vaccination and manage underlying chronic disease, as well as the long COVID um, long tail of the pandemic that we're seeing around the world. Thank you for your attention. So let's move to the panel discussion. The panel will be moderated by Sanjay Gupta. Sanjay is a multiple Emmy Award winning chief medical correspondent for CNN and a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and we're very proud of him. Uh, Dr. Gupta has covered some of the most important health stories in the United States and around the world. Throughout 2020 into 2021, Sanjay reaffirmed his role as a trusted guide to viewers worldwide on navigating between facts and fiction surrounding COVID and the pandemic. So please join me in welcoming these world-class experts and Sanjay, who share their invaluable insights and experience to advance the knowledge of global gathering. Let me turn over to Sanjay. Thank you uh, so much for that kind introduction. Uh, What an honor to be here with all of you. 
and a particular honor to be with uh, these esteemed panelists. Let me just say, uh, it's been a challenging, very busy, relentless 20 months, I think, for all of us. I am always amazed at the, uh, the pace uh, that uh, all of you keep uh, on a regular basis and the incredible work that you do uh, in terms of not only taking care of patients, but also advancing science and being incredible ambassadors for good information, uh, which uh, is more necessary than ever. So uh, I'm honored to be here. I, I, there's so much to discuss. We only have half an hour. I encourage people who are watching to submit their questions as well. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible. But maybe I'll just pick up right where we left off uh, with Dr. Banerjee. Um, I, I find the whole concept around long COVID so fascinating. I remember when I first heard, and my background is neuroscience, so you know I come at it from a little bit of a different angle, but the idea that a virus would cause isolated loss of smell or isolated loss of taste, and we would call it a respiratory virus, trying to reconcile all these things initially was a bit challenging. You just mentioned that there wasn't a significant correlation between hospitalization and the likelihood of developing long COVID. What do we think? What's the latest sort of thinking on what is happening with long COVID? And are there other diseases that you're looking to as models for this? Thanks very much, um, Sanjay. And, and uh, I, I think the, the bottom line is uh, there's so much we don't know about this. The most studied type of long COVID is in the hospitalized cohort. And we're starting to see data to suggest clusters of symptoms which might be around inflammation or around um, particular affected organ systems, neuropsychological, uh, cardiorespiratory. But in the non-hospitalized cohort, um, we, we see a much greater variation in the type of symptoms. Fatigue, breathlessness are common, but as you say, um, the, there could be loss of smell, brain fog, uh, myalgia, all kinds of things going on. And so, so we, we need a combination of the mechanistic research in epidemiology as well as testing things. I think the old model where we have figured out the mechanism and then start trials, if we do that in the current emergency where um, in countries like um, the UK and the US where infection rates have been high, we're seeing tens if not hundreds of thousands of people with long COVID, we need to build the plane as we're flying it, so to speak. We need to um, be, be testing treatments in all comers as well as in certain subgroups of symptoms. Is there, and is there anything to be sort of, uh, any insights to be gained from the papers that have come out showing the impact on decreasing long COVID symptoms after vaccination? So I think we're, we're seeing that um, First and, and second dose uh, um, vaccination in epidemiology studies is is uh, related to a lower rate of, of long COVID. Um, in in the the Western context, where in in some countries we're starting to see booster vaccination, that, uh, and in other countries we have the opportunity to test whether that is actually a, a real effect. Um, but as I said, I think uh, avoiding infection and vaccination are the best and maybe the only things in our armory that are proven at the moment. Um, uh, Dr. Ja, Ashish, um, and, and for, again, thank you for, for all you do. I see you all over the place and you, you've been such an important voice in all this. I know you know that. I know everyone knows that, but just thank you again. Uh, it really is more important than ever. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation. What is the impact uh, of these disparities with regard to vaccination globally? You talked about Africa specifically. How does that manifest, do you think? Yeah, so Sanjay, I mean, I singled out Africa as a place that has been particularly, I think, hit hard by vaccine nationalism for a couple of reasons. I mean, obviously, you have a whole continent that has little to no vaccination. The impact is you still have large outbreaks happening in many African countries and a lot of uh, infections and, and suffering uh, that at this point, nine months into the into a time period where we've, or 10 months since we've had these vaccines is really wholly unnecessary. Um, and when you have five to 7% of the African population vaccinated, that means you still have a lot of very high risk people, older people, people with chronic diseases who are not. And that I think has gotta be part of our strategy. So the impact is, 
from a public health point of view is substantial. There's a second issue, which I think is really worth highlighting, which is in this pandemic, we have seen so many healthcare workers get infected, get sick and get and die. And, in, and it's obviously always a tragedy, but in places like India or on the African continent where healthcare workers really are in short supply, their losses will be felt for a generation in terms of the impact on health of everything, not just COVID. Um, so there's sort of this urgency to get healthcare workers protected around the world that I think has not been met uh, with the right set of tools from a, from a global policy point of view. Mm. And last point, of course, is variants arise, as you heard from Dr. Weiss, uh, can arise from anywhere in the world and can affect all of us. And all the major variants we've dealt with have come from outside the United States. No reason that the next one can't come from within. Uh, but as long as we le let large outbreaks happen in other places in the world, uh, everybody remains vulnerable. So many reasons why we need more global vaccine equity. Uh, but even from a pure selfishness point of view, we've got to get the whole world vaccinated. Ashish, in terms of lessons learned, um, you talked about you know prioritizing certain populations for the vaccine, especially in places where you know uh, demand is outpacing supply. Uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee just talked about the syndemic really sort of uh, uh, being uh, a little bit clearer on who is at risk. Is there a lesson going forward, do you think, in terms of how we think about vaccinations? We prioritize in the United States in terms of age, for example. Should, should there be priorities in terms of risk factors as well? Yeah, there's always a trade-off. And the challenge is, and you know, you saw this in the US, Sanjay, when in the in the months of December, January, February, as we were, we had we didn't have enough vaccines, we were trying to get these things rolled out. Um, that there is no doubt about it, there are other high priority groups beyond age. Age is the biggest risk factor for bad outcomes. Uh, but people with chronic diseases obviously at higher risk. There's a complexity that is added when you start thinking about those issues. And the question is, do you have a health system that can manage that complexity in places that do, that can identify your high-risk population irrespective of age, uh, target them effectively? Absolutely makes sense to me uh, that you want to factor that into your vaccine rollout process. In, in a nation like ours, where we have very fragmented health systems, where a lot of people don't even have access to healthcare services, um, trying to bring in the clinical uh, features ends up actually often tripping us and making it much harder to get these things done efficiently. So I ended up at the end concluding that for us, the best approach was just to focus on age. Uh, but that's really because of the system that we have, not necessarily for the, because of the system we'd want to have in our country. Dr. Banerjee, did you want to comment on that at all? So in, in uh, the first couple of waves, we we did try exactly what you suggested as Sanjay in, in the UK with 10 or more groupings based on age and and high risk conditions uh, that that proved difficult to mm -hmm. implement. It, I, I think in the first wave, it was more successful um, and, and, and it, the, there's um, various issues with the booster program, which is now taking off in the, in the UK, I, I think. Uh, I, I agree with um, Ashish broadly that it, in, in a more universal healthcare access setting like ours, it does make sense. I would say uh, on the access to vaccines in Africa, which um, I totally concur with Dr. Jha, I would say that um, we need to do better at tying uh, impact to incentives. So we pay for drugs and vaccines without looking at the impact and and, and so that focuses on high income markets, whereas if we focus on the actual threats to us as, as a population, as a globe, we would, we would have different um, structures in play. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a topic that maybe is worthy of its entire own panel at some point. Uh, and but maybe we'll circle back around to that. I'll tell you, we're getting lots of questions already coming in here. So I'm going to try and get to as many of your audience questions. But Dr. Weiss, thank you for, again, all you do. And I, I always learn something. I've heard many of your presentations over the last year and a half, and somehow you teach me something new every time I, I listen still. So thank you for that. <laughs> your last slide had a question that you sort of forecasted that I, I, I don't know if you put it on the last slide because you didn't have an answer or because you wanted to be asked, but I will go ahead and ask it anyways. Is the anticipation that these variants will continue to emerge or do they reach some sort of optimal fitness and, and sort of stop? 
Okay, the reason I put it, I didn't discuss it was I ran out of time. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I think we don't really know the answer to that. But I think that um, the fact that the Delta variant has really been dominant now for several months, nothing else has taken over from it, makes me a little bit optimistic that maybe it's, it's like asymptotic. It can only mutate so much because it, the spike protein can only tolerate so many mutations. After a while, any new mutation might make it less less functional. So we may reach a, a point where um, where it stops mutating. I think that's possible. I don't want to say for sure, but it looks that way to me. There's a question that has just come in as well from the audience. Uh, Susan, I'll throw your way, Dr. Weiss. Uh, if you can comment on, on ACE2's role in modulating entry into the lungs and the kidney uh, and, and maybe other systems as well. So I just Googled that as we were <laughs> here. And actually, so ACE2 is expressed in the, obviously in the lung and also in the kidney. So ACE2 is the cellular receptor. Um, and I just wanna make a general comment about receptors. They're obviously, they're, they're necessary for viruses entering the cells, but it's not like the more receptor, the better the infection. It, it, you don't always need a lot of receptor. So as long as there's ACE2 there, I think you can get an infection, but there is certainly not every cell with ACE2 will be infected because there are other parameters that will affect how well the virus replicates. So I can't say much more except that the presence of ACE2 would suggest that the kidneys is a, is a, a target for infection. Uh, Dr. Silberswag, did you wanna to add to that at all? Uh, sure. So we know that patients who are on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers actually had higher levels of ACE2, but there were not correlations between clinical outcomes looking at infections or mortality in those patients compared to patients who are not on those drugs. So while, as Dr. Weiss said, the receptors are necessary, it doesn't appear that they define the illness. When you when you think about chronic kidney disease patients overall, uh, Dr. Silbers, why patients on dialysis, do, are, are they, uh, they're obviously considered higher risk as we saw in Dr. Banerjee's presentation. What does that mean for, for boosters going forward? So as you well know, the data shows that for all patients, uh, boosters are beneficial, that immunity, at least based on the spike protein, uh, wanes over time. Um, the data for patients who are on dialysis is that they don't mount as strong an antibody response to the vaccines to start with, and that it doesn't appear to be as long lasting. So I think boosters are definitely indicated for all patients with chronic kidney disease and certainly for those on dialysis, not only because of the immunity, but also because of the increased risk of exposure, because obviously they need to go to dialysis three times a week. I think we would all agree that it's as it's best not to get infected in the first place, uh, to do everything you can to not get infected. But there's been some recent uh, uh, st stories about the Merck antiviral compound, Dr. Silberswag. Um, I know that, as you mentioned to me earlier, there's not a lot of data yet here. But what? How, how do you anticipate the use of of these types of antiviral compounds, especially in the in the in the renal population? Sure, so thank you for that. I think it's really a critical statement that there isn't a lot of data. The same was true with monoclonal antibodies when they first came out. The same was true with vaccines because patients with kidney disease are often not enrolled in clinical trials. And I think that's a really critical factor is getting our patients enrolled in clinical trials. Um, in terms of how the Merck uh, agent will be used, it, it is a bit unclear at this point. Um, there is not data. I think 2% of the patients in their trial had chronic kidney disease, but the severity of the disease was not, not defined in, in the New England Journal paper. So it's a little unclear. Um, I suspect that we will ultimately see benefits as we have for the monoclonal antibodies and for the vaccines. So I think that as we gain information, as we follow the science, as you and Dr. Fauci like to say, um, we'll have a better understanding of how to use these agents. Ashish, you know, when you talk about Africa, it's interesting. I, I, I can't help but think about uh, the, the contrast with what's happening here in the United States. So we have about 190 million people, I think, that are fully vaccinated. Um, but, you know, there's been these, these uh, incentives from cash to Krispy Kreme donuts to you name it. And now, obviously, even later today, there's probably going to be more news on mandates at the federal level. I'm wondering if you, you could comment on the science of mandates versus negative incentives. This is a specific question that is coming from the audience. 
Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. And, and, and obviously, I think federal policymakers have really struggled to think about how do we increase vaccination numbers? And, and, and by the way, the motivation for it is, you know, as long as I mean, I think at this point, even if you count in natural immunity, we may be at 75, 80 percent immunity as a population. It's just too low for the Delta variant, right. given how contagious it is and what its uh, replication kind of levels are. And so the question has been, how do we get higher levels of vaccination so we can start really putting this pandemic behind us and get to some sort of endemicity where our lives can go back to uh, a version of normal? And the, the everything has been tried, as you know, Sanjay, like we've sort of thrown the you know book at this problem and, and we're stuck. And mandates and the data so far suggest that mandates actually really work. And I think it's complicated. Like it's not just a simple issue of you're forcing people. For a lot of people, I mean, there's a small proportion of people who are truly anti-vaccine and will not take it almost under any circumstances. But for a lot of people, they're not sure, or they have a lot of cognitive dissonance. They may want to take it, but they're hearing from family and friends that it's dangerous. What, what mandates actually do is I actually think they reduce that cognitive burden in a lot of people. I know a lot of people who just feel this incredible sense of relief. Well, I got to do it for work or I got to do it mm. for. And, and, uh, and what we've seen empirically is about 98, 99 percent of places of uh, people who when a mandate goes in, end up getting vaccinated. Uh, and so I, I have was reluctant initially as a public health person to push, push people, but I've really come to believe that it's a very effective tool in driving vaccination numbers up. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. You're, su you're suggesting that the mandate may sort of provide cover uh, for people who, who have this cognitive sort of concern or dissonance over it. Is there a lesson going forward, do you think, Dr. Ja? I mean, if we have uh, another, another you know, uh, emerging pathogen, that uh, how we approach that? Well, I think, you know, the problem is a reason we need mandates. I mean, if you think about it, this horrible disease that's flattened our country for a year, we've developed these incredible vaccines and you need mandates to get about a third of Americans to take it. There's, it's worth spending some time trying to think about the misinformation context that we have that's leading to these issues and how do we counter that. Um, I generally think mandates should be used as a last resort. Uh, persuasion, other things are, are much more uh, ideal. Uh, but the lesson is that unless we can deal with the misinformation problem, uh, this is a tool we may have to use again in the future. And, I, and I'd prefer not to, but we may not have other choices. It is, you know, and again, you, you've done an incredible job of this, but there is this battlefield of information. And, you know, as a general rule, I, I think more information is good. But there's been this democratization of information that has made it difficult for people to uh, sort out what is good versus bad, what is mis versus dis information. How do you strike the balance, uh, Dr. Ja, between you know, the certainty and the uncertainty? People expect science to be like math. Two plus two will always equal four. And yet it's not that way. So how, how, do, you, how do you strike that balance without losing credibility? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I will say that sometimes I try to model you, Sanjay. But um, <laughs> and what, the way okay. I think about this is it is a battlefield. And by the way, we need more combatants on the side of good information. And that's a plea to all of you. Physicians are among the most trusted people in our society. And we need more physicians speaking up. And, and you know, physicians actually have a way to do this that we do all the time with our patients that I think actually works quite effectively in the public sphere as well, which is, you know, when I think about it, when I'm in the clinic or actually in the hospital taking care of patients, um, the key is, what are you trying to do? You're trying to present the best evidence you have you acknowledge the uncertainty that you have, and then you provide judgment. People are looking for judgment, they're not looking for certainty. And I think if you communicate in that way, um, mm. most people respond quite effectively and quite positively to that. And so along the whole pandemic, I try to be honest about what we don't know, but then not leave it as we don't know, give them your judgment call of your best sense of where things are and where they're going. And I think people really value that, honestly. And then, and then obviously, if you get it wrong, you acknowledge it and you explain why and you, and you move on. Uh, I think that's something physicians do really well. And I, I want more physicians to be involved in this. Yeah, I think that's a good clarion call for anyone who's listening, you know, to, to not sit this out at all, not that people are, but to make sure they're they're really engaged on this and, and letting their, their voice be heard. You know, uh, Dr. Silbers, why, People have heard about COVID, obviously, word spread very quickly. This is a question that's coming in from the audience. Kidney disease affects uh, 850 million people worldwide. Um, it doesn't have the same urgency, obviously, as what we have with a pandemic, but the, these are huge numbers. And, and 
people often don't know uh, about their own kidney disease until it's progressed, till it's late. What, what, what can, how do we get the word out about kidney disease in a way that, that sort of rivals that urgency of COVID? So I think there really are, are two factors to it. One is, as Dr. Jaw said, it's about physicians getting out there and talking to their patients, talking to their communities. The other part of it is the, is the knowledge campaign that the American Society of Nephrology has, has started that Dr. Quaggan spoke about in her plenary uh, address this morning. Um, and I think it's getting the information out and getting it out in an unbiased way um, as Dr. Jaw talked about, physicians can make judgment as to where they're getting that information and then be the conduit for that information to their patients. And I think, as, as Dr. Jaw said, that's a critical role for all of us. D Dr. Weiss, th there's a topic that always comes up that is, uh, is always, it it's becomes very provocative very quickly. And I don't mean to provocate in this way, but when you look at, at this, this virus, uh, and you talked about the furin cleavage site, for example, is there any more insight into the origins of this virus? Uh, I, I read Christian Anderson's paper. I've read several of these papers recently, uh, and I think everyone has their own point of view on this, but how, how about you with your background? Okay, so I'm completely 100% convinced that this is a natural virus from 99% from bats. Um, recently, there was some viruses isolated in Laos that from bats that have a receptor binding region. So it has all the amino acids needed to bind to the human ACE2 in, the, in these bat viruses. And they're like 97%, I think, uh, related to SARS-CoV-2. So I think that's, um, that's the viruses came from bats. The, we don't have the exact precursor virus or ancestral virus, but that takes time and we're getting closer. And we, and we don't really know if there's an intermediate species. And I just want to comment on the furin site, which has made the huge, huge fuss. So some coronavirus spike proteins have furin sites and some don't. And the reason why this one was made into such a deal was because the SARS-1 virus does not. But some of the other beta coronaviruses, these are all so-called beta coronaviruses, do have it. And um, among some, say the mouse coronaviruses, some have it, some don't. It's just that each virus, these viruses really evolve. And the more they replicate, they evolve, as, as I sort of alluded to. And some of them evolve to a point where they really need a furin site to be highly functional, and some don't. So I think that's a real red herring about the furin site. So, and, and the other really important point is that you can't make a virus de novo. You have to start with a known virus. And unless we believe that the people in China are completely lying, nobody's ever seen viruses like this before. So you can't, nobody would have the ability to mm. make up a sequence of a virus. So I think for those reasons, um, it's, it's clearly a natural virus, in my opinion. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Banerjee, uh, this is a question that's coming in for you. Uh, you. You mentioned in your presentation, mortality was around 0.6 in patients with kidney disease and COVID. Uh, the question is, were they vaccinated patients? Uh, I don't know if you know in that particular cohort, but also how do you, uh, you know, just how do you arrive at these, these mortality rates? Thank you. Uh, th that, was, that was in unvaccinated patients early, early on in the pandemic. And uh, the, the first way to, to look at this is in, in um, large scale national electronic health records and uh, it was easier before vaccination, but that was when the mortality was was much more frightful, uh, where where we we could look at people's pre-morbid conditions in their linked electronic health records, which leads to how important the advances of access to data and data-driven research have been in this. Um, going forward, um, it's it's important to take into account what proportion of the population has had vaccination and when when we when we try and try and develop our kind of revised estimates if you will you, you know you you talked about this a little bit earlier as well but this, just this relationship between covid and autoimmunity you you talked about in the context of of long haulers but when you when you look at your your data dr banerjee um, do you anticipate an increase in autoimmune disease in chronic kidney disease 
uh, if you're forecasting a couple of years into the future, what will be sort of the longer term ramifications, not just long haulers, but longer term ramifications on some of these syndemic diseases that you mentioned going forward? It's a really interesting question. So, so autoimmune uh, diseases in themselves can have can lead to a higher risk with uh, acute COVID complications, and with and we're seeing with asthma, um, for example, there's there's been uh, higher right. higher rates of long COVID in people with asthma. Uh, we need more large scale data in in some of the rarer autoimmune diseases. But I would say autoimmunity is one of the mechanisms that is is coming up. That there's um, in in inflammatory uh, processes, but also uh, there's there's a phase two trial that's just started from led by the University of Oxford of an investigational compound looking at mitochondrial dysfunction and and reducing that. So we are we need multiple. Um, efforts to, we haven't got an answer that covers all comers with long COVID at the moment. We, we are, we, and there's just so many questions coming in. We just have a couple minutes left, uh, but, but I want to try and get to as many as Dr. Jot, just quickly, do you expect or anticipate uh, the same sorts of hesitancy in Africa and the African continent as you've seen other places once supply is, is, is ramped up? I think, Sanjay, this is a fabulous question. And actually, I think this is one that's getting very little attention. Um, I do expect there to be a substantial amount of vaccine misinformation across the African continent. Uh, I think it is going to cause a lot more challenges right now. You know, the problem is whenever you have a mismatch between demand and supply, you always hear from the people who really, really want it. And you have this sense that there's a deep well of demand. There is in Africa, as there has, was in the United States, but I worry a lot that the misinformation is going to affect the African continent, uh, obviously varying by country, uh, ev potentially every bit as much as it did in the United States. And we've got to be very thoughtful about uh, our strategy to getting vaccines out, but also working with countries uh, to make sure that we really address those issues of misinformation. Is there an obligation of pharma, uh, Ashish, to, to allow um, local production of these vaccines to occur? Absolutely. Like uh, to me, that is not a, especially in a pandemic, I mean, especially in a situation like this, and we can have a conversation about whether Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J are doing enough, AstraZeneca, uh, others, I don't mean to single, single out any one of them. Um, and I would argue that overall, they are not doing enough. And, uh, and, and so that is, a, that is an issue really for policymakers uh, to push them. And of course, it's also for them, the companies themselves. But absolutely, there is. What, what, do, what do you think, Dr. Soberswag, has been one of the biggest uh, lessons for you? I mean, first of all, I just have to compliment, you know, you, you were showing the response team output. It's incredible work uh, that your team has done in getting the message out there, doing these interviews and, and making sure, again, good information is, is available to people. But for the kidney community, uh, a lot of the work that you do, what has been one of the insights or lessons? So first of all, thank you. Uh, our team's been, been great to work with. A lot of people have put a lot of time into it. Um, you know, I think two big lessons come out of it. One, as, as you do so expertly, is getting good information from people who have knowledge and data to share and then sharing that with as many people as you possibly can. And the second part of it is data sharing. Um, one of the great things that we've been able to do through this pandemic is sharing data among the chief medical officers of the dialysis providers. But as you know, data for patients who are on dialysis is collected by CMS. And that, but that data is not very easy to get into the public domain. And the quicker we can get that data out there so that it can be shared and researchers can have access to it, the better the information that we'll then be able to pass on to the physicians and to our patients. Is there, a, is there a critical step in making that happen? Because I feel like we always talk about the necessity of data sharing. Um, it seems like it should be simple. But what, I think you're right. You know, I, I unfortunately don't know where the barrier is, but I think you're absolutely right. The data is available and it should be very easy to access. And I'm not sure whether the block is in politics somewhere or if it's within the nephrology community. But I think it, it would certainly be worthwhile getting people together who can sit down and evaluate where the barriers are and how to overcome them. 
I have to say just on another note, you know, nephrologists have always struck me as the, the really, truly the smartest doctors in the hospital. One kidney can outsmart three or four doctors as far as I can tell. So uh, that's quite a compliment that's tremendous... coming from a neurosurgeon. Well, I know, but I think us neurosurgeons just got credit because basketball coaches always said, Hey, it doesn't take a brain surgeon. They should have said it doesn't take a nephrologist to be honest. Um, Susan, you, you mentioned, you know, your, your views on obviously the origins, how, how often are these jumps occurring and, and, in, I guess, how likely are we to see something like this again? Well, we don't really know how often they're occurring. Um, and I think that um, we probably will see it happening again. I think, I think people are looking very hard in, in bats and other species to see what's, what viruses are there that could actually uh, make the jump. But I, I would assume that there will be jumps in the future. Yeah. Does that, Ashish, you think automatically mean another pandemic? I mean, if, if, if emerging pathogens are a given, the idea that they then turn into a pandemic is is the likelihood of that is what, do you think? Can I just say something else? Oh, yeah. That? Um, so recently there were some viruses identified, I think in Singapore in children that were coronaviruses, but they're not lethal viruses. So not every virus that's going to come out of a bat or every coronavirus is going to be a really scary lethal one. That's just... I, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Ashish. You know, yeah. obviously, so much of this was preventable. But, but if pathogens like this are inevitable, how inevitable are pandemics? Yeah. So I think more broadly, um, I, I've been saying probably for about five years that I feel like we are entering a, an age of pandemics where the idea that the last major pandemic that most people know about happened 100 years ago, somehow suggesting that that means we have another 100 years before we have to deal with another one. A even mathematically, that's not how it works. But B, we should absolutely expect that we're going to see more multinational kind of regional or even global outbreaks because there's a set of circumstances that are changing. Um, as Susan has laid out, you know, most uh, new novel infections in humans come from animals. Uh, Human-animal interactions have really changed a lot in the last 20 years. That's accelerating globalization. Climate change as a real risk factor for all of this uh, means that we just have to prepare differently um, none of us can predict when the next pandemic is going to come, but I think what, one thing that we all can agree on is we want a far more effective response, earlier response, more effective response uh, when the next such pathogen shows up. Yeah, and I think there's been a, a lot of lessons learned. Um, we've gone over time, um, but if there is a, another pandemic, I, I will be right there with all of you. Uh, hopefully, uh, all of us trying to do our part. So uh, Dr. Soberswag, Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Weiss, and Dr. Jaw. Thank you very, very much. And thanks, thanks for all you do. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.